You are listening to the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, a member of the Shameless Podcast Network. Ever since Mountain Maid CBD founder Mike Passion came on the podcast way back in the beginning of season one, I've been lucky enough to call them a sponsor. And I say lucky because I love CBD. I preach about it to everybody. Mountain Maid is the best in the game. They've got lower than the federally compliant level of THC, so it ships nationwide. But they've got enough THC that you get the entourage effect. It's the best of both worlds. I love their boost. It's a 10 milligram chewable. It's orange sherbet and white tea leaf flavor. It's fantastic. I take a couple of them throughout the day and it's got me feeling pretty good. If you want to start the morning on a high note, they've got Build. Build is a 50 milligram quick release tablet to take it with your coffee. You get it going in the morning and you feel great throughout the day. At the end of the day, they've got Recover and Recover is a 25 milligram chewable It's mango flavored. It's got magnolia. It'll leave you feeling pretty nice at the end of the day. My wife and I even picked up their dog chewables, which our dog loves. She's got anxiety. She's a rescue dog. And just one of Mountain Maid's chewables leaves her feeling pretty good. But here's the thing. Don't just take my word for it. I turned my wife on to Mountain Maid and she loves it. So let's hear what she has to say. Mountain Maid is the only CBD I have ever loved. The only CBD I've been willing to purchase over and over and over again, and I don't see that stopping. So go to mountainmadecbd.com, and when you check out, tell them Choose Your Struggle sent you. This week on the Choose Your Struggle podcast, I chat with the delightful Jeff Harry. But first, Kid Mental, let's go. Things ain't always gonna go our way. But you can always win when you choose your struggle. And some battles will be yesterday. But today is for a new weekend. Choose your struggle. And don't worry about what they say. But you can always win when you choose your struggle. And you can bounce back just as day. Come on and listen in to choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. This is episode 7. I'm recording this on the 26th, which is Tuesday. This week is all sorts of nuts. Tomorrow is the very first Rock Bottom Storytellers. I'm very excited. And I'm just trying to knock out as much stuff as I can before that. I've also got another awesome interview for this show on Thursday meeting with some other people about a new project I'm working on that I'll tell you all about in a couple of weeks. Just a busy week, and, and that's a good thing. I mean, these are all incredible projects. You know, Rock Bottom is, I'm so excited about it. It's taking shape, and tomorrow it's going to be amazing. Uh, by the time you hear this, it'll already be out, and some of you probably watched it, and so I say th- <laughs> thank you. For those of you who didn't, please go check it out. I'll definitely be sharing the recording all over social media, and I'll probably end up putting it out as part of this podcast at some point once I figure out how to do that effectively. Now, this season is off to a pretty great start. The, the, the numbers are good. I'm not, I'm not, you know, you guys know I'm not that worried about that, but the, num- the numbers are good. What's more impressive is how many of y'all have reached out. As always, I really appreciate that. The responses have been wonderful. You like Monday motivation, or, or at least those of you who do are the ones reaching out. If you don't, I want to hear from you too. That's fine. And, and I kind of wanted to take this opportunity, we're a month in now, to sort of check in with how the season is going, let you in on some things. Number one, you know, I, I made a lot of changes in the off season, as you know, but one of them was I started recording with a different software. I'm no longer recording over Zoom. That software was called Zencaster, and unfortunately, I'm moving on from that pretty quickly. It did not work as well as as it was supposed to. I know other people use it very effectively, and and, and to them, I say congratulations. For me, it just wasn't working. Audio wasn't getting to me the way that it needed to. So moving on to a new one, I'll I'll be updating about that later on. Now, another awesome improvement is this may sound a little better to some of y'all. I want to thank Noah Mariyama of the incredible, incredible podcast, Campu which is the story of a Japanese-American incarceration. Some of you may know about this from the time of World War II. Some of you may not, but this country did uh, lock up many Japanese-Americans in internment camps. And Noah and his sister, Hannah, 
are telling the story of this in a really compelling and, and beautiful and sad way. I got turned on to the podcast because Noah took time out of his day last Friday to chat with me over Zoom for, oh man, we talked for over an hour. He, he was giving me great tips on hardware, on software, on techniques, and you know, he did it out of the kindness of his heart just because he really appreciated what I'm doing with this podcast. <laughs> the, the key takeaway, which Noah I really appreciate, was he said, it's amazing how far you've come with just a plug-and-play <laughs> microphone, uh, which was a really nice compliment. Like, you're doing this amazing work despite not having all the best tools. And so Noah really helped me upgrade my uh, microphone and, and all the stuff I'm working with. So the fact that this sounds better, thanks to Noah. What that means is, is that over the next month or so, you'll start to hear that more constantly improve as I do more interviews with this mic and, and some of the new techniques Noah taught me. So if, if, this, if the sound of this podcast was annoying to you as it was to me, uh, know that it's getting better. And by the time spring rolls around, that will be a distant memory. So that's sort of the update about this season. There's some really incredible people coming up that I'm very excited about. I uh, was on a chat yesterday with someone who I'm like, wow, it's pretty cool. I get to talk to this person. That happens a lot, you know, but uh, definitely yesterday, there's going to be some great interviews coming up. Real quick, a shout out to someone who calls themselves Colonel Skip on Apple Podcasts. I want to thank you for your very kind review. Gave it five stars and said, fascinating and fun. He's a first-time listener, and he said he was blown away by the podcast. He's excited to check out more, and he's glad he subscribed. Those are the kind of reviews I love. Uh, I don't read all the reviews, obviously, but when one of them gets emailed to me or, or someone you know tags me and says, hey, did you see this, stuff like that, and it's a nice one like that. I want to take time to say thank you to Colonel Skip. Uh, if you're listening, please, you know, keep up, keep, keep it up, share, share the podcast, all that kind of stuff. And everybody else, leave reviews. It's in the, the show notes. You can find it just, just by going to your, your player. If you're, if you're one of the ones that, that has reviews, if not, go to the link in the, the show notes and you can leave a review there. Now, today's podcast is, I don't throw, a, <laughs> I don't throw about the word delightful very often, but Jeff Harry is absolutely delightful. If you go to his website, which is rediscoveryourplay.com, and go to the About Jeff page, it's a picture of him and a bunch of kids very excitedly playing. That's Jeff's thing. Jeff is one of those guys that uh, you look at his job and go, I didn't know that you, <laughs> you could do that. He is a person who works with businesses, with, or with individuals, with community groups about rediscovering your connections to others through play. He is an absolutely just wonderful person, a very, a, like I said, a very delightful person. You are going to love him, and, and you're going to want to reach out to him and follow him. He's just a very interesting and wonderful guy. I'm so glad I got to talk to him. Enjoy this conversation with Jeff Harry, and stick around to the end for this week's Good Egg and Card. If you listen to the podcast, and of course you do because you're hearing this right now, you know that I always ask my guests what their preferred method of self-care is. Well, here's my answer. A good cup of coffee. This year has truly made me appreciate the little things that make my life better, and a good cup of coffee goes a long way. That's why I switched to Four Sigmatic and I haven't gone back. They use mushrooms in their beans, and it gives me a kick in the morning that I didn't know I needed before, and now I miss if I have anything other than Four Sigmatic. Once you give them a try, trust me, you're not going to want to go back. So go check out the link in my show notes or on my podcast website, and use the code CHOOSEYOURSTRUGGLE, all one word, at checkout to get 10% off. Check out Four Sigmatic today. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends. If you're listening on Apple, please rate and review or check out the review link in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm all about being like, let me have as many eggs as possible. No, son, you don't understand. I want all the eggs. That <laughs> Give me all That's the a real eggs. Ron Swanson vibe. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so the first question I always ask is, is what, what brought you to where you are? To, I mean, what, what made you want to do this work? Sure. So I'll give you the uh, Batman origin story, um, <laughs> the short version. So do you remember the movie Big with Tom Hanks? Of course. Yeah. So I saw that as a kid and he danced on the piano and then they offered him a job as a, in a toy company to basically <laughs> play with toys. And I was like, that is a job. And then there I started writing toy companies that day, third grade. And I didn't stop for 15 years until I was in the toy industry. And then I got in the toy industry. And I don't know if you've ever gotten exactly what you wanted and then been so disappointed when you get there. <laughs> but like I was in a cubicle. Why, why are the walls padded? This is super weird. You know, no toys, no fun, no, no play, no kids. Like they might as well have been selling socks, dude. Um, and, you know, I left all jaded and I, uh, Moved from New York to the Bay Area, um, had no idea what I was doing, um, found a job on Craigslist where they were teaching kids engineering with Lego. So they were playing for a living. And I was like, dude, they're playing for a living. They're only paying 150 bucks a week, but they're playing. So I'm down. And then I stuck with them and we took it from seven people to 400 people. It became the largest Lego inspired STEM organization in like in the country, but we did this all by playing. Like we had no idea what we were doing. We made it up as we went along. We, we, uh, pick cities because we thought they were fun. We picked people because we thought they were fun. We experimented, we failed miserably a lot and we just kept experimenting. And then finally Silicon Valley started paying attention to us. Facebook, Google, Adobe. We're like, Hey, do you do team building events? We're like, yeah, of course we do. Even though we didn't, we just said yes to everything because that's the play mindset. And um, for the next like 10 years, I was running team building events for like the top tech companies in the world. But what I found was they talked about being agile. They talked about being disruptive. They talked about being innovative, but they weren't doing any of that, dude. They were like, they were, you know, they had it all on their walls, but they hadn't created psychologically safe spaces for people to be themselves. So I created Rediscover Your Play as a way to like navigate hard conversations and create that psychologically safe work environment using positive psychology and play. So first off, that's awesome. Uh, I'm so it's so cool that you were able to pivot from I got what I wanted. It sucks. How do I go to something that I actually do want? Right. Because. You know, I, I've had job coaches and stuff like this on here, and that's a very common feeling of people uh -huh. thinking they know what they want and from the outside, and then they get in and they're like, this isn't at all what I wanted. And and sometimes that ends in disaster. The person sticks it out or whatever the case is. You went, I'm going to go find what I want. I'm going to go figure this right. thing out. Right. And and also, you don't define yourself by your results, Right. Like we think our happiness is on the opposite side of something, right? The opposite side of, of my business hitting six or seven figures, the opposite side of me getting X amount of followers. And like, let's learn from Michael Phelps, man. Like a documentary was just done on him where he had 22 gold medals, you know, goes into a depression right after his last gold medal. So like it can't, the happiness can't come from the results. Like the joy and the fulfillment has to come from the actually doing the work or being paid to be you or identifying what is it that brings me happiness, joy, and following my curiosity rather than pursuing the result. Because even if you have the perfect job like Anthony Bourdain traveling the world eating, yo, you might not be in the best mental space. So we have to be very careful about that and spending more time focusing on being present because you know, expectations are the thief of joy and adults get too fixated on expectations and results. So we'll spend the second part of this interview really talking about the work that, that you do. You've been in some really interesting situations though. you said, you know, you, you've consulted with these really big names and also you worked with a company where you got to play with Legos all day early on. I can imagine that there were people who came into those interviews and did the things they were supposed to do, buttoned up suit and who were very stiff. And, and those probably weren't the people that got the jobs with you guys, right? No, if you showed up in a suit or you couldn't, kneel on the ground and play with Lego or you didn't want to go on the ground, it was over. The interview was over. 
It was as simple as that. You know, if you couldn't, we would ask ridiculous questions like, what would you do with 10,000 ping pong balls? And if someone's answer was like, I'll make a ball pit. And that was it. Like, they were just like, I don't know what to do. And they couldn't play. We were like, you're not the right fit. You know? <laughs> like, like Tony Shea at Zappos used to pay people three grand to leave. Like after a month, if you didn't like the job or you were just like, yeah, this is kind of a fit, but you know, but you weren't like really nerdy and just like, you know, showing up as your true self. And you're just like, you know, this is way too, uh, you know, fun of an environment. He'd be like, I'll give you $3,000 just to leave. And that's how he created a culture of people that wanted to be themselves because this, you know, my, you know, business mentor, Stephen Worley would always say, don't you want to get paid to be you? Don't you just want to be you and be paid for that? So why wouldn't we be trying to pursue that? So I completely agree with you, and I love that. And that was one of the reasons I had to leave. Uh, one of the reasons I was very excited to leave sort of the nine to five culture and do my own thing right. was that I felt like I could actually be myself. But for the longest time, that was not not only was that not celebrated, it was discouraged at work. Oh, absolutely. And it seems like we're moving in a positive direction t- away from that. Would you agree with that? I think we're slowly. I think right now we're in that faux authentic, right? Where people are like, oh, show up as your authentic self. Oh, by the way, you got to get this deadline done. You got to do this and you got to do it this way. So it's just like, you know, it's kind of a bait and switch right now, but at least we're starting to lean towards more being authentic. But what does that even mean, right? You know, can you really show up as yourself? Like uh, Viola Davis says, you know, you either claim who you are or you end up chasing your worth for the rest of your life. How many people do you know chasing their worth? How many people do you know that believe they're being authentic, but they don't even know how to be real with themselves? So like this is more of a process, an internal process than an external process. But for team leaders, they really do have to be asking themselves, how do I create a psychologically safe space so people can at least slowly start to be more of themselves. Yeah, that's a really good answer. I, I, what I struggle with is cause I've done a little bit of not, not similar, but, but in, in overlapping work with some businesses about creating good company culture. And it's so hard to unlearn a lot of these really harmful ideas that Absolutely. come into play in the workplace. Absolutely. Well, the reason is because those harmful activities are still happening. Like, if, you know, if you pretend like, oh, we're trying to change the work culture, it's just like, well, are you? Like, you're still letting that toxic guy run around and do whatever he wants. You know, you're still being all passive aggressive at meetings. You're still running a bunch of meetings that really could have been emails. Like, you know, if you're not showing it through your actions, then it's kind of just like BS, you know, and then you, so that's sometimes even when I'm talking to companies, I'm like, do you really want to change the work culture? Do you really want to address this toxic person at work? I run a workshop with my friend Gary Ware called dealing with a-holes at work through play. That's literally the name of the workshop. At first we thought it was just like a joke. Oh, no one's going to say yes. And then there was huge amounts of interest in it because people are like, we all have a-holes at work. And then you find out $223 billion has been lost by Fortune 500 companies alone in the last five years due to a toxic person. And that's only the People, oh, that's only the companies that are willing to admit that there's a toxic person there. So it's like when we're talking with these companies about, okay, do you really want to address this? Are you willing to have those hard conversations? Because if not, then you're not ready to work with us. But let us know when you are. So a lot of a lot of the responses to this issue are we need more people of color. We need more women in the boardrooms. And that is, of course, an answer. Yeah. But I don't know that that goes far enough when, in, in my opinion, and you can tell me if you disagree, that a lot of these issues are capitalistic in nature. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, you could fill the board with a couple POCs to check off the box and be like, look at the diversity we're doing. You know, I saw this quote recently that was really interesting where someone was like, man, I'm tired of all these diversity hires. What's up with this? And then someone responded to them. They were like, what about all the homogeny hires? Meaning like, <laughs> how many people are you hiring just because they not only look like you, but act like you, right? Or they're from the same college or a similar college. Like I ran a workshop with a friend of mine, Tashawn, called How to Not Be Racist at Work 
by accident, right? And the, the workshop, we explored how in the mid 1980s, people were being discriminated against based off of their name, right? Like if your name was Tyrone or Tashan or some other, you know, black or brown sounding name, you got discriminated against. Well, they compared those studies to now, to 2020, same result, the exact same result. Nothing's changed, dude. Like nothing's changed. So there's that aspect. But then talking about the capitalistic aspect, let's talk about the eight hour workday for just a moment, right? Created by Robert Owen in 1817, this labor activist and business owner, eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure, eight hours of sleep. Nobody touched it for over 100 years. Then Henry Ford during the Great Depression was like, or around the Great Depression was like, oh my gosh, no one's coming to work because I'm, people are dying on the assembly line because I'm working them up to 15 to 20 hours a day. So I'm changing it to an eight hour work day and I'm doubling everyone's salary, which causes like ruckus in that industry, right? But since 1920 fucking six, I love that I can swear on this podcast, Nothing's changed. 94 years, we're still doing the eight hour workday. Studies have shown most people can't focus for more than three hours and 51 minutes of a given workday. And our workday is now extended. It's now like 8.8 hours. So the question is, is what are we doing for 5.8 hours of the day? Stupid meetings, making up work. Like how many reports do you make up to show the, the work that you're doing? right? Like reports doing work of doing work, right? Like we're making up work just to show how busy we are. And it's just like a waste of time. And they even just did this study, I think in Japan with IBM, where they ran a four day work week and they were more productive in four days than they were in five days. So it's like, what are we doing? Like, like, are we focused on quality work or quantity work, right? Like the pandemic has shown us we don't have to show up to an office in order to be productive. We just need people that actually care enough about us and care about us doing our, our zone of genius work so that we can actually do our best work. I love all that, and, and I couldn't agree more. When I was still working the nine to five thing, I, I my boss knew if I had shit to do, I was the last one out of the building because I was going to get it done. But I was never going to make stuff up, and it led to some days I would leave my desk after three hours and go home at lunch because I'm like, why am I still here? Why you know there's there's nothing for me to do. I, I, one thing that I think that is, you brought up the pandemic that has been a really cool, a really interesting outcome is I was reading this article. It might have been Psychology Today a couple months back about about how more people in the young professional generation, which is mine, I'm not going to presume your age, but we're, we're, we're asking their bosses or telling their bosses that their clocking in time was the minute they got in the car and not when they got to the office. Because it's like, why should that person, if they have a 50 minute commute to the office, why should that be their time that they're losing? They're doing that for the, the boss. They should be paid for it. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I don't see why not. I mean, again, this it, besides like, I guess some that work is like measured by labor, right? Like a lot of office work, you, a lot of the time you're not doing your best work. There's a lot of BS jobs out there. Okay. There's a lot of BS companies that frankly shouldn't be existing, you know, in all honesty. So, you know, we are spending before the pandemic, we were, most people were spending at the end of their life, eight years in traffic, eight years. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, what, so that I can sit next to my boss so he can make sure I'm doing my work? Like, oh, gosh. So, you know, whether, I mean, whether you want to pay for them to, you know, to drive there or not, whatever the case may be, you, what you should be focused on as a team leader is what is the work that my staff does the best? What is their zone of genius work? I would reach out to your staff right now and be like, hey, what work do you what work is the work where you forget about time? Oh, is it working with clients? Oh, it's connecting with people. What percentage of time do you currently spend on that work? 15%? That's it? How can we increase that to 20 or 25%? Because studies have found that when you do that, all of their other work gets better. It has a ripple effect. And if you're like, well, I don't know if I believe that, I kind of believe that, you know, BS, look at Google. They have a 20% rule where they give a fifth of their time for their staff to pursue work that 
is most curious to them, as long as it benefits Google, what has come out from the 20% rule? Google Meet, Gmail, AdSense, billion dollar ventures that Google is now built on is because they allowed their staff to play and pursue their curiosity. So it's just like, it works. Why are we not focused more? Maybe we can't give a fifth of our time to have our staff pursue that, but we can give them five more percent to pursue the work that they love to do most. And it also it also just misunderstands the way the brain works. None right. of us ever are creative by forcing ourselves, by staring at a blank screen and by just pounding into our keyboard, right? I, if I'm struggling with, with, a, with something on this podcast, whatever the case is, I go for a run and I know – that I'm going to think of the right answer while I'm out on the run because that's the way our brains work. Exactly. So why are we doing brainstorming sessions in rectangle rooms in a rectangle table and then you have an hour to come up with the greatest ideas while your boss is criticizing every one of those ideas? You have not set up a safe space at all for any good ideas to come up, but maybe just an opportunity for the boss to be like, my ideas are the best, aren't they? You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh my goodness. I heard this crazy study. This was a few years ago where they interviewed top executives, not CEOs, but the people right underneath them. And they were like, how many of you share your best ideas with the CEOs or you with your top people? And there are 80% of them were like, no, I don't. So right now, all of the stuff we have, all of the inventions we have are mediocre versions. <laughs> there are better versions out there, but we didn't let people, we did not create a psychologically safe space to pursue that iPhone that you don't need to charge every five seconds. Oh man, I love it. All right. Last question before we really pivot and get into your work is, is, you know, yes, we're changing. Like you said, very slowly, we're in sort of the, the, the fake step forward at this point, but how do we, really push forward. I mean, our, our gener this, the, the YP generation seems to get this a little bit more, the millennial generation, yeah. but we can't just count on the changes to be made. What, what things that people are listening, what can they take back to their work to help make this change? We have to show up with more humanity. I was just writing an article about employee engagement. It's just like, how much are we checking in with our staff? How much compassion and grace are we focused on? Are we still really focused on pre-pandemic numbers and trying to hit those, right? Like we have to really understand what is... Why, do, why is our staff there in the, in the first place? Do any of the leaders on, that are listening on this know what language of appreciation your staff like operates under, right? Like the languages of appreciation are the, you know, do they like gifts, meaning like bonuses? Oh, if you like to give out bonuses, you can actually spread out a bonus over the, the course of a year and it has an exponential rate, you know? Oh, you know, a language of appreciation of like words of affirmation. Are you giving praise in front of everybody else, you know, to the staff member on a consistent basis or acts of service? Hey, go home early, or wrap up early because I know that you're going through some tough times that, you know, with your family right now. Like, where is the shared humanity? You know, it's it's funny. There's a organization called Work Human that's just like, we're bringing humanity back to work. And it was like, really? Like, is that revolutionary right now that this, this group, we're going to give credit to this group? Like, we all should be doing this. This is not this, like, especially during this time where people are dying on a, you know, every day and, and we might be connected to those people. Like I remember my friend Sally was at a meeting, um, you know, high powered, you know, executive meeting and they were talking about a deadline and they were like freaked out because they're like, we're not going to get our fourth quarter's numbers in. Oh, it's going to be, oh, this fourth quarter is going to be one of the worst ever. And they're like freaking out. And she was just like, I just got over cancer. Like, do they realize what actually is important here? Like, I don't think you understand what an actual deadline is. Like, you know, we have to just have more context right now of, you know, what this actually means and to bring more humanity to work. And when you don't see it, to call that out, to call that bullshit out and be like, listen, like, you can't act like a toxic person anymore. I'm not going to deal with that anymore. 
I, I love that. And, and I just think back on, you know, the old stereotype of the boss who gets to work, says hello to his secretary, goes into his office, closes the door, and nobody sees him until the end of the day. And right. it's like that, we we just can't, that that won't work anymore. That just doesn't work. Or, or let's stop celebrating the Steve Jobs or the Elon Musk or the Jeff Bezos of like overworking people. Like, like let's stop celebrating that, right? Like, let's stop deifying a-holes. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're, so, some of their businesses are built off of burning other people out. And the reality, or at least what I tell people when they're like, well, why would I want more play in the workplace? Yo, Stephen, Stephen Johnson, who wrote Wonderland, said the future is where people are having the most fun. So, you know, TikTok is thriving, Hulu is thriving, Disney Plus is thriving. You know, look at the companies that are thriving right now. If you're not having fun at work, people are leaving your company, all right? And and also customers are leaving your company. You know, people are leaving Instagram because it's not fun anymore, but they're gravitating toward TikTok because it is. So, unless you want to be the next blockbuster, you might want to start infusing a little bit more play and fun into your workplace. I love it. If, if people are listening and they're, and they're just picking up what you're putting down, they want to reach out to you. Tell my listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you on social media, all the good stuff. Absolutely. Social media wise, Jeff Harry plays. That's where I make all my ridiculous TikTok videos. And I'm all on all the handles, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that. Um, or simply go to my website, uh, rediscoveryourplay.com. Hit the let's play button. I have a bunch of, of ways in which you can actually engage your staff with play in the workplace. And then let's hop on a call, man. Let's figure out how we can create like a psychologically safe space so your staff can kick ass in this world. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that it's not the only thing I do. Choose Your Struggle is an entire brand. I speak, I coach and consult. I have rock bottom storytellers. There's a lot going on. And sometimes I get to a project and I go, man, I just, I can't do all of this myself. So I turn to Fiverr. It's so easy to find incredible professionals who can help me out. I've hired people to help with marketing, help with SEO, help with my website. So much great stuff all on Fiverr. I even found Kid Mental who did the incredible theme song on Fiverr. So if you have a project that you need some help on, Go check out Fiverr. Use the link in the show notes or my podcast website, and you'll help the podcast in the process. Check them out today. Enjoying the podcast? Consider supporting it on Patreon. You'll get behind-the-scenes looks, sneak peeks, extra bonus content, and best of all, a way to interact with me, your host. You'll also get discounts on merch like tank tops and magnets and all the other services I provide like booking me to speak, coach or consult, or even advertise here on the podcast. Check it out in the show notes or in patreon.com slash choose your struggle. Plans start at as little as $3.40 a month and all the money goes right into the podcast. All right, let's get back to the show. Find me on social media. Check the link in the show notes or search for me, Jay Schiffman, on YouTube and LinkedIn, and choose your struggle on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So great transition there. If, 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 you know, let's talk about now what it looks like to actually hire Jeff Harry players. What what is what does that do when, when you come into a business? Talk us through that 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 whole process. So it really depends on what you're trying to address, right? So I've gone into businesses like biomedical companies where they're trying to get their staff into flow. Like they feel like they're in a rut, like a creative rut. So then we explore, we run workshops around tying play, a lot of their play values. I run this with my colleague, Lauren Yee, where we tie play values of what they used to do to a, as a kid to what is the type of work they do now and how do you merge that so that you can get the most creativity and flow out of people. So that's just like one workshop we run. Or I run a workshop, like I said earlier, called Dealing with A-Holes at Work Through Play with my colleague Gary Ware, where we actually practice 
How do you have hard conversations to deal with this a-hole at work, right? Because if you think about like sports, for example, in the NFL, they practice all week for a three-hour game. But when you go to work, you never get to practice. You never get to practice having hard conversations. You never get to practice how to lead. You have a lot of leaders that don't even know, like they just got promoted, but they don't even have any management experience. So they don't know how to lead. And it's just like, we need to have more opportunities for people to practice, especially having hard conversations. So in the dealing with a-holes at work workshop, we actually practice how would you confront that a-hole? What would it be like to be that a-hole? What would it be like to confront the boss of that a-hole, you know, and, and the more you actually practice that conversation in a psychologically safe environment, the more likely you'll believe that you can go have that conversation when you go back out at work. Because whenever I'm running a workshop, I'm not just running it so you feel good. I want to run it so that when I check back in with you in two weeks or a month, I'm like, what, pro what progress are you having? You know, how many hard conversations have you had? That's my metric of success. You know, how many of your staff are feeling more engaged at work because they're doing more of the work that they love to do? Or, you know, I address create creative people and be like, let's deal with your inner critic because your inner critic is getting in the way of all of your success. So we'll run a workshop on how to play with your inner critic. So each and every one of these workshops is infusing play in one way to address a major pay point at work. So I, with companies like yours, with, with, with projects like yours, a lot of times the group or the team or the person who needs it the most is the one that isn't looking for you. So how do you, you know, yes, it's one th amazing thing to get into the group. Like you said, it actually wants someone to come in and help them refine their creativity. But what about the groups who don't even know that that they need this or they know and they're just like, oh, we don't want to do that. Like, how do you how do people like you reach those those guys, those companies? Well, here's the thing is this like, you know, you can't force someone to play. Right. <laughs> that's the worst. I mean, that's why team building events a lot of times suck. Right. It's because it's forced fun. It's just like, is everyone having fun now? And it's just like, no, not really. You know, <laughs> so I wouldn't force a person to participate. Right. Like, but. Again, what we're trying to do is simply get the people that are on board to do it because even when you do that, it has a ripple effect. So for example, in the dealing with a-holes at work through play workshop, that's the workshop's not for the a-hole. It's for everybody else. It's to empower everybody else so that they don't tolerate that a-hole anymore. So that they start sending boundaries around that a-hole and that person's behavior so that the next time that a-hole goes after them, they're like, whoa, 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 Chad. Sorry, we're going to use Chad as the example. <laughs> Chad, but don't talk to me that way. And once he's just like, oh my gosh, Jay and Jeff just shut down Chad. Maybe I'm going to shut down Chad now. And then everyone starts setting their boundaries on Chad. And then Chad can't operate the same way. Chad can't be an a-hole anymore. So he has a choice. Does he continue his behavior? and then keep getting blocked out or does he leave you know and then that's a challenge for them right so so with each and every one of it there's a ripple effect even if you're tr tapping into people's inner you know critic a lot of people are going to be like oh i don't want to deal with this but the more that you start seeing it work with other people then you're like oh man that per that person is super successful or that team that's playing more they have less turnover well if that team is less turnover and they're having more fun, maybe we should start looking into what they're doing and maybe we should start adopting some of that. So what do you do when, and I'm sure this has happened at least a couple of times, when the Chad is in the room, when, when you're trying to do these trainings and Chad's sitting right there? Oh, we were we run it right with right through them, you know. We run it it's like we we don't we don't state who the a hole is. We don't need to. Everybody knows, right? If you ask any team, like who's your a hole, everyone's gonna be like, of course, it's Chad. But we don't need to state it there. We're gonna treat Chad just like we'll treat Jay or Jeff or whoever it is else that's in the room because we're we're also teaching Chad, like, hey, Chad, do you have an a hole? You know, because at the end of the day, like. He can benefit from it. And the whole time he might have his arms crossed and be like, this is stupid. 
all right, fine. It's not for you, dude. Like, you know, you know, you can stay, you can go. You know, no one's holding you hostage here. But guess what? Later on, man, you're going to be having a lot of those hard conversations. So you might want to stay in practice. But if you don't, hey, more power to you. You do you. Is it hard to do these trainings when it's like either the manager or the HR person has brought you in because they're really, you know, about it, but it's clear that the team is like parts of the team isn't on board. Like how, how does that go? Absolutely. That's why now we do a lot of pre-sessions to make sure that the people that are actually in the team want it because like, because I've been there when you are like forcing it, when you're forcing something and they don't want to hear it, you know, you, you, with, with with play, you got to remember play is all about flow and openness and, you know, and creativity and like, and this opportunity to say yes or no, right? And if you're in a state where everyone is like, no, right, then you can't really help. I remember, what was it? I think Sean Acker was doing a talk, you know, about happiness, but they had just laid off like half of the staff right before he joins in. It's just like, Okay, you've not set this up for me to be successful. So right. we are really aware of that beforehand to be like, okay, do we have enough people bought in to this before we step in? And if not, then it's okay. We we can walk away from this. But, you know, we don't ever want to force it because if people are not ready, then they're not ready. Do you, when you kind of kick this thing off, address sort of everyone's uh, stigmas against, you know, uh, doing, you know, trust falls and, and all the kind of stuff that you see, like joked on in movies and all that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 We address all that shit. You know, we, we go right there. We go right at it actually, you know, like in our dealing with a-holes workshop, we're like, Hey, we're not going to be doing any of that bullshit. But what we will be doing is we want you right now to embody the a-hole that isn't your work. Let's go. And then we're going to do it for like a minute and people are going to be like, what? And it's just like, we go straight into it. Like we dive in to be like, Look, we're going on the deep end. We're asking you to follow this with us for the next hour and a half. It's not going to be forever. And trust me, the more you're willing to play, the more you're going to get out of this. And you'd be amazed how many, we were just running this workshop in Australia right before lockdown. And the amount of people that were both laughing and crying because it was for the first time they were like, oh, I thought I was the only one that had to deal with an a-hole and quit my job because of an a-hole. Like when you see people connect with each other's inner child and see like, I'm not the only one, man, that's like one of the most powerful things you can do at a workshop. So you are clearly the kind of guy who has a lot of energy, but being in front of a group and really being present takes a lot of vulnerability. Yeah. Are, 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 are there days where you go to do this and you're like, man, I'm, I'm struggling today. It's going to be hard for me to, to, to get this energy up or, or is it kind of like acting where you just, you're able to turn it on? Um, that's a great question. Whenever I don't have the energy, as soon as I see the first adult start playing, I get, I get it back. I get it back because like, that's what, that's why, you know, my organization is called rediscover your play is like when you see someone tap back into their inner child for like the first time in like a decade or 20 or 30 years. And you're like, Oh my gosh, you're, then you realize, Oh, this is not about me. Right? Like, Oh, you know, this could be a magical moment for a lot of adults that haven't tapped back into their creativity in years And then I'm like, oh, I have to show up fully for this. So as soon as I get that jolt of energy, that dose, that dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, I'm like, man, let's go. I'm into it because I'm doing it. I'm doing it as a service for them. And I'm getting something back because I'm like getting the reciprocated energy of all of their excitement. I love it, man. I I can only assume, though, that COVID has been very difficult for this. Um, actually, you'd be surprised. It's fascinating because it, it's again, it's however you want to see it, right? That's that's the adaptability of play is, yes, I have not been able to do in-person workshops, which I love, but also I've been able to run two workshops in Canada that I didn't plan on running. Right. I've been able to work with people in England that it would never have happened. I've been on like a hundred podcasts and a lot of them have been on international ones. Again, wouldn't have happened because of COVID. Right. So it's like, it's, 
it's fascinating, like the opportunity. I just did a, a workshop for the Department of Homeland Security. Probably would not have gotten the clearance to do that otherwise if we weren't in the middle of this crazy pandemic. So, you know, I, I don't know. I've, I'm seeing a lot of the silver linings in this, you know, and I think for each person, they have to do that. I remember I was working with an individual client as I do that as well. I was coaching a client and, and she was just like, I love to travel and I can't travel right now. And we were like, well, how do we figure out a way in which you can do that still. What do you love most about traveling? She's like, I love most talking to people from other countries and having fascinating conversations. Can we still do that? And she was able to find travel networks where now she's on these travel happy hours every week, talking to brand new people from all over the world so that when this pandemic is over, she has like 50 places she can stay at. Right. So again, we have to look at this and be like, how do I reframe this problem right now we're having using a play oriented, growth oriented mindset and try to tackle this from the perspective of a child? I love it. Uh, really well put. And, and that's going to take us perfectly into one of the two final questions I always ask. But before I do that, one more time, for those who are loving what you're putting down, where can they follow you? Where can they reach out? All the good stuff. Sure. Jeff Harry plays is my handle or rediscoveryourplay.com. Hit the let's play button and we can figure out how to, you can kick ass more. We'll <laughs> Oh, I love it. Uh, so so as I was saying, that kind of leads great into one of my final questions, which I always ask. Number one is, you know, not just during COVID, but especially now, what are your self-care habits? What what keeps you getting up every day able to do this work? So it's interesting. Um, I love making TikTok videos. Like, you know, they have no ROI value. They're not productive in any way, but they're just fun and creative and I enjoy them. And whenever I make a TikTok video to start my day, whenever I start my day with play, I prime my day to see the rest of the day as play. And then my friend Desiree taught me this really great question called, how can it get any better than this? So whenever something good happens or you start your day in a fun way, you ask yourself with curiosity, how can it get any better than this, right? So for example, today, oh, I created a video. How can it get any better than this? Then I hopped on a podcast with my friend, uh, Stephen Worley. How can it get any better than this? Then we made this ridiculous video. How can it get any better than this? Now Jay and I are talking, how can it get any better than this? You know, and you build and you see start stacking and positively priming your day to see everything else as play. Now on the flip side, you could have a bad day. And I challenge people when they say they have a bad day, because I say, no, you had a bad moment because thoughts only last between nine seconds and 90 seconds. And then you ruminated about that bad moment until you look for the next bad moment and the next bad moment, thus adding up to a bad day. But if you simply shift by asking yourself with curiosity, how can it get any better than this? You can shift your entire day and potentially your entire life. Well put. I love it. Really great message. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, one of the, the things I always work with clients on is starting the, the morning with positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. So you're heading in that positive direction. And then if something does come, you're only hit down a little bit and you can keep building it back up again a lot easier. Uh, really well put. I appreciate that. And the that. brain science between the, behind those mantras, right? Is you're like, oh, well, they're all woo-woo. Well, actually, what you're doing when you're saying, hey, I'm living in abundance or, hey, I'm going to you know, get all these clients this year. It's going to be exponential. And you keep saying it over and over to yourself. What's happening is you're telling your brain to start looking for those patterns, and then those patterns start to appear, you know? So when people are like, oh, you know, what is luck? It's really is hard work, but then also opportunity, but also mindset where you believe it's possible. I am going to get on Oprah. You keep saying that to yourself enough times. Who knows? Maybe that's going to happen. Maybe you beat someone that meets someone. You keep saying it out in the world. So like we can say it's all woo woo, but positive psychology talks about how it's positively priming your brain to look for patterns. Well put again. I really appreciate it. I, I hate to do it, but the last question. Uh, so we spent the last now about 40 minutes learning why, you know, you're awesome. We should follow you. But 
who are some people that have influenced you that we can all go follow? Who are you reading? Who are you watching, listening to all the good stuff? Yeah, great question. So there's a few different people. There's my friend, Eric Bailey, who wrote a book called Cure for Stupidity. Um, and the, the, the whole premise of it is, you know, when you go into conversation, are you going into conversation to be right? Or are you going into conversation to, to understand? Because you can't do both, right? So that's a huge one. Uh, Gay Hendricks uh, with The Big Leap, he talks a lot about being in your zone of genius, the stuff that where you forget about time. You have your zone of incompetence, things you suck at, zone of competence, things you're average at, zone of ex uh, excellence, things that you're good at that you like to get praise for. That's where a lot of people spend their time in their zone of excellence. But your zone of genius is your play work. It's the work where you forget about time, where you'll get pay you would be willing to do this work even if you weren't getting paid. This is flow work. So identifying your zone of genius as well as exploring um, self-sabotage and why we do a lot of self-sabotage. Well, well put. Again, Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much for coming by. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. This was awesome. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge sports fan. I start every morning by listening to the Locked On Celtics podcast, and I never miss a Reds game. So when it's time for me to grab a gift for the sports fan in my life, I check out Fanatics. They have everything you need from the best teams, the favorite players, and all the stuff is good. As a memorabilia and autographs collector, I trust Fanatics. But here's the best part. Fanatics always has some kind of discount going on. From free shipping to 50 to 70% off some items, you're going to get a great deal every time at Fanatics. So check them out using the link in the show notes or from my podcast website and help the podcast in the process. Check them out today. Subscribe to my Patreon for behind the scenes looks at the podcast, sneak peeks, and bonus data. You'll also get a discount on Choose Your Struggle merch. Find it at patreon.com slash choose your struggle. All right, we've come to the end of another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Jeff Harry. Was I wrong? Is he not, is he not delightful? I think he's pretty delightful. And the idea of returning play to our lives is so important. And you know, I talk a lot on this podcast about self-care, but there's very few things that are as good for you as sort of uh, physical play, right? Whether it's going out and, and playing a sport that you enjoy or, or, you know, personally for me, what that looks like a lot is laying down with my dog and, and playing with her because she loves it. I love, you know, getting you know down on my hands and knees and rolling around with her. She's a lot of fun. And it puts a smile on my face and it releases endorphins and dopamine and all of the good things. So, you know, it's a great message. Thank you, Jeff, for, that we all need to return play to our lives. And, and that's beyond just video games. By the way, I'm a big fan of video games. If you don't know that, if I think I've said that before, but MLB, the show, the older version's not this year because it was terrible. <laughs> and, and games like Skyrim, Red Dead Redemption. I'm very excited about the new open world Star Wars that will be out next year. Uh, I'm very torn about the Harry Potter ones, as a lot of people are. I'm probably going to play it uh, because I love open world games, especially if it's Harry Potter. That sounds incredible. But I understand the reluctance for a lot of people. I 100% get that. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is video games are great. Don't get me wrong, but it goes beyond video games. Play in other ways that actually get your body moving is incredibly important. So we're going to go ahead to the card. This week, we are using the Believe in Yourself cards from Blurt, as always. Thank you, Blurt. I didn't really have a, a thought behind why I wanted this card pack this week. I just did. I, I think it's really important to remind ourselves from time to time that it, believing in yourself is super important. And, and I know that leading up to tomorrow, again, I'm recording this on Tuesday. Rock Bottom will have already happened when this came out, but I, I'm, I've been nervous about it. It's a big deal. My first time hosting this thing online. I'm very excited also very nervous. And so reminding myself, number one, I, I can do this. Everything about this I can do. I'm just nervous about a new thing is very important, right? Because it's easy to say, oh, I can't do that. That's a lot of work. And, and it is. And it's, it's things that I've not done before in different aspects, but I can do it all, right? So reminding myself of that's very important. All right. And here's your card. This is a wonderful one. 
You can only be what you are able to be. You can only do what you are able to do. It has to be enough. You can't give what you don't have. Now, that's wonderful. And that goes into what I was just saying is kind of reminding yourself, all right, I am able to do these things. But also the other side of that is recognizing where you don't have the skills. And I think that's super important to bring other people into your lives and say, hey, you're amazing at this thing, right? I'm amazing at this other thing. Let's work together. I was just messaging right before I I started recording this with an incredible person who I'm going to be on their show. They're coming on mine in a way later. It's going to be great. But they also want to do some work together in another way because they're like, hey, this is a thing that we're trying to do. You have these skills. We don't. Would you mind helping us out? And I really appreciate when people say that, not only because it gives me a chance to do some new work and to uh, help other people, but also because it shows uh, maturity to say, I don't have this skill. I recognize that. Can you help me? So that is uh, something I would encourage you all to do this week. And it goes right into uh, the the good egg. And, and that is, I like to think of myself as a pretty good writer. I, I do. I do it a lot for different people. A lot of times about mental health, substance misuse, that kind of thing. But also, I've, I've ghostwritten, I've done that kind of stuff. That being said, I love when I find someone who just has it in them in a way that I don't think I do. And I want to give a shout out to someone I've mentioned in this podcast before. She is someone who's really influenced me, Haley Granger. She is a young woman I've met in, in, in England who's just such a great advocate around mental health, specifically when it comes to things like uh, eating disorders and relationships with food. And she has a blog called Scales Are for Fish. You can find it in the show notes of this episode or just search Scales Are for Fish. All about her thoughts around these things, around her personal struggles. And I'm just so in awe of her. We chat probably once a week, uh, find out how her her fight against uh, these issues is going, what's going on. Uh, you know, in her advocacy, that kind of thing. Uh, she's a, a very big fan of the show, <laughs> so thank you for listening. A- and just is is such an impressive writer in a way that I recognize that I'm not. So your good egg this week is to go check out that blog. Again, it's in the show notes. And also to do that action, to reach out to someone and say, hey, you know, whether it's just a congratulations or thank you or whatever it is, like this is a thing you're good at that I'm not, and I appreciate that in you. Or it's, hey, I need your help because I have this thing going on. I can't do it. You can. You're better at this than me. We aren't taught that. We're taught to, you know, figure it out, that kind of thing. But, and sometimes that's really good. But other times it's really important to say, you know, I don't have that skill. You do. Let's work together. So do that this week. But most importantly, as always, show your empathy, be vulnerable, spread your love, and choose your struggle.